James, thank you so much for inviting me to your lovely studio again on the Sunday afternoon. It's so nice to see you again. It's a real pleasure to be here. And actually, it's interesting because today I'm the one who's in the hot seat and getting the grilling. <laughs> in fact, probably about five years ago when you were last here, the tables were turned, yes. weren't they? And yes. I remember it was a lovely occasion where you were playing Beethoven's first concerto. And we invited some friends around and we had, um, I think we had a meal and some party afterwards. Yeah. But um, that, that, that memory still sticks in my mind yeah. for a long time. Because you cooked salmon, I remember. Did I? I think you did. Oh, dear. I'm still cooking salmon these days. I've, <laughs> I've tried to improve my repertoire a bit during lockdown, but um, salmon comes up as an old staple, yes. Yeah. Well, I remember it being very, very big, and everyone just couldn't have, just couldn't get enough. Right. Well, I hope it wasn't overcooked or undercooked. It's perfectly cooked. Oh, good. Excellent. Good. Well, first of all, can you tell us about the studio, a bit of history about the studio, and when did you first move in here? And yeah, Yes, um, <clears throat> I'm surprising. I've lived here for 38 years. I think that's right, which is quite shocking, really. I first moved here as a student, and a very, very good friend of mine, Philip Folk, he was, he's a very well-known pianist, he was the landlord here, and he converted the studio from a, I think it was a clothes workshop. And um, then two years after I became his lodger, I think he didn't like the fact I practised all the time, so he moved and I stayed here. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, we've been friends, friends ever since, but he went, went elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And so um, this is probably not dissimilar from how it was 30 years ago. And I love having two pianos because um, I, I like them side by side because it's really good for, for teaching and also for playing two pianos and for playing duets, indeed, if I want to be um, separate from and have to have room to do the pedalling and everything. And yes, surrounding here is a collection of books and CDs and all sorts of things. In fact, you can't see from here, but over that whole wall is all music. And quite a lot of it I bought in Moscow. Um, it was a funny story because there were three three music shops in Moscow when I was a student. They were absolute treasure troves and gold mines. And there was a very nice little old lady in one of them. She used to know I'd come in every couple of weeks and she'd save me interesting things. She said, oh, you might be interested in this. And then I'd see the complete Metna sonatas or something and snap it up. It would cost next to nothing, probably 40 pence or something. And then I got all this music in my hostel in Moscow, you know, piles and piles of it. How am I going to get it home? And so what you had to do was you had to wrap it all up in brown paper parcel, two kilogram parcels, and then you had to take it to the central post office. So I wrapped it all up, put it in my suitcase, which I then wheeled down to the central post office, and then um, turned up at the counter. What have you got in here? Um, Music. Oh, you can't take music. You're not allowed to export it abroad. Oh, no. So um, I said, well, can I take books? And she said, yes. And so I've crossed out music and wrote books. And then that's how it all came <laughs> to the UK. Yes, it all came. <laughs> so that's, um, oh, gosh. That, was, that was Soviet um, life. That was a small example of what it was like to live there as a student. Mm. And I remember another thing. I went and the Ravel Piano Trio costs a fortune here. because it's published by Durand. But there it cost about 10 pence or something. So I was so excited to buy it took it back to my room and found there was a part for piano and violin, but no cello part. So that's not great. So I went back to the shop and they said, no, we don't produce a cello part. <laughs> did, you, so, did you find a reason why they didn't produce it? No, I think they just, they just said, no, we don't, have a, we don't do a cello part. Okay. So um, there all sorts of curiosities like that. Yeah. Um, um, but speaking of lockdown, how has lockdown been as a, as a professional musician? I know it's been affecting quite a lot of people, but what about you personally? Yeah, it's funny because I've always dreamed of having a sabbatical and hoped for one. And then when it came, it was really unwelcome mm. um, because everything happened so quickly in such a shocking way. And I think we thought it was going to be for quite a short time. But in fact, it's gone on and on. And I've just had some work cancelled now, which is supposed to be next March in the Far East, which is really disappointing. Um but we have to be grateful for things like Zoom because Zoom came along in a flash and I hadn't even heard of it before. And it's enabled us just to carry on doing our teaching in some sort of way. Um, so all my teaching jobs have continued. I know quite a lot of people have done online concerts. Um, I found that slightly difficult, perhaps at my age, um, because I really do just need an audience and sort of feed off that um, sort of symbiotic relationship. Mm. Um, but teaching has been able to continue, examining um, I examined for ABRSM and they've switched quite swiftly to being able to do things online as well as in person, which is great. Music adjudication was online and I'm pleased to say I did my first live 
adjudication just yesterday. I was back in action in Wantage in Oxfordshire, so that was that was very nice. As far as mood is concerned, I'd, I'd have to admit I have been in quite a dark place sometimes because it's just really shocking when you've been working away and playing away for years and years, suddenly to have everything so much changed. And I'm so used to being in control of my own situation, suddenly having all that taken away is really quite a quite a big shock. And, um, you know, you have to abide by all the rules and regulations and just go with the flow. And it was it was really quite worrying this summer because I didn't know so last summer, you know, where the next work was going to come from and how it was going to all pan out. Mm. But I've been quite lucky because I have quite a mixed portfolio, dare I say, of teaching and playing and adjudicating and examining. So quite a lot of my work has been able to continue. Mm. And I keep being grateful for the fact that 30 years ago, if it's happened then, we'd have been teaching down the telephone and you know, so much would have been not possible. Mm. So you've been approached to do... Um, virtual concerts is that is that what you were saying but you turned them down or did you do some virtual concerts there's been a mixture I did one virtual concert but it's really odd because I didn't feel very nervous beforehand and I did it and then I couldn't go to the pub afterwards or anything so it's a bit of a non-event both before during and after Mm -hmm. and I mean I could do it um, maybe if I it was the only way I could earn a living then I I would do it but I've actually not really been animated enough to do it Mm -hmm. I've um, learned some new repertoire um, which, are, which is sitting and lurking for concerts in the future. I was lucky enough to come out of lockdown in September and do a couple of recitals and try some of the new stuff. And two weeks ago, my trio again came out of retirement and we were able to perform in the Frinton Festival, um, which is Robert's festival in Essex. Mm. And so we did a trio concert and we got two friends, um, invited them along with us and we played the Trout Quintet and the Hummel Quintet. And that just felt so lovely. It was quite sort of nerve-wracking in a way. Also because of COVID, um, we had to just rehearse and meet on the day and I hadn't met the viola player and the bass player before. So it was all a bit of a sort of emergency and then one of us got stuck in traffic as well. But everyone was very professional. The two colleagues were extremely good musicians and we we played together and we had a lovely concert. Mm. And what was so nice was the audience absolutely really loved being there and hearing music. Mm. I I, I guess so because they've been away from live music for such a long time Mm. what's really reassuring is you know in certain parts of the country you know the audiences do tend to be of an elderly side and we were slightly worried that perhaps they might not come along they might be rather cautious but Mm. actually that was not the case and they were sort of clamoring to come Mm. and I must say I even noticed that in the summer because I went to the um, bridge theatre to hear some Alan Bennett monologues and the audience were even older than me which was marvellous and very reassuring in a way because you might think that older people might be a little bit more cautious about mm. um, going out. Yeah. Did their enthusiasm influence the way you performed as well? I would like to think so. I mean, I really, really enjoyed it. And OK, it might not have been an immaculate, perfect performance. And um, actually, I wasn't really nervous as well. I, I thought I might be. It just felt a bit odd. I thought, am I going on stage? Is this really me? Is this really happening? Mm. Um, I think I was so relaxed about it and so happy that it was, it was really fine. Yeah. If you could just say um you mentioned you're learning new repertoire so mm. repertoire would you mind telling us what you're learning no i mean um i i had a project which went horribly wrong actually it was to learn all beethoven's 32 piano sonatas i remember you yeah you said yeah yeah by the age of 40 yeah. well i probably told you that some years ago <laughs> so i'm now even older i'm 55 now <laughs> actually 56 and i've still got five to go and um <clears throat> it's a rather odd list of the ones which i haven't learned i hadn't learned the first one and the last one And then Opus 10, number one, which is a small one in C minor, and then the tiny two, Opus 49s. So I thought, right, the last one is the one I've got to do. So I did learn it last summer, and actually I performed it twice um, in September. They were quite modest venues, and the audiences were extremely modest, but I didn't mind. I was so happy to to do it. Mm. So now it's been sort of hibernating, and hopefully it'll emerge again. Yes. So that was one piece. The other one was Chrysleriana by Schumann which um, I started ages ago and I still haven't performed, which again feels very odd mm. because normally um, you l- start learning a piece and you have a, an end date inside and there was no end date, so I learned it more slowly. Normally I'm quite motivated, but I must admit I found it quite difficult to um, get the motivation going at certain points. Yes, I think a deadline is always good. Mm. Deadline is always good. Yeah. Um, I think it was Leonard Bernstein, wasn't it, who said the best thing to to do a really good project yes. is to have um, a really no good idea time. and not quite enough time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly it. 
Mm. Um, with the Beethoven sonatas, it's such a big project. Why mm. would, um, at least let's, let's take it from your perspective, why are you doing this massive project? What's the motivation behind this? Well, people often ask me, who's your favourite composer? And that's an impossible question because it's like saying, who's your favourite friend? Um, and it varies. It depends what mood you're in, what mood they're in, what the relationship is like. But I couldn't live without Beethoven. And the extraordinary thing is, the longer I live, I think I love him more every day. And the most amazing thing of all is every time I play him or teach him or listen to him or whatever I do with him, I, I find more in the pieces. And they are, they are certainly what Schnabel says, they're better than they can be played. And so even yesterday in my adjudication, I was listening to something and I heard something new. I hadn't thought about it before. And that was great. Mm. And um, so there's a sort of fathomless um, depth to them. And um, that's the reason why Alfred Brendel has recorded them not once, not twice, but three times. He feels there's something new he's got to say. So it's, in a way, it is a project, but it's maybe not so much a but it's such a slow project, it's barely a project. Um, but I just wanted to learn them all and to perform them all. That was the, the criteria, really, to, to perform them. Mm. And um, I think they feed off each other, and if you learn one, then you learn more about another one. And then if you, obviously, if you know all the symphonies and string quartets and piano trios and things, that's a great thing as well. Mm. One of my favourite experiences, I think, was with my piano trio to perform the Beethoven Complete Piano Trios, and we've done that probably 20 or 30 times. And that's that's a wonderful series to do. Mm. And the other thing is the Beethoven sonata, they're all different from each other. They're all completely different and they're all masterpieces. Mm. That's the other amazing thing. Mm. You see many famous pianists do Beethoven sonatas in a cycle. Has that Have you done that before? Or if not, would that interest you to do it in a cycle? It would. I mean, realistically, it's quite difficult to put on eight concerts and do them in a close period of time and get the audience, especially now. But I think it, I'm not closing the door on it, but actually for me, more importantly is to actually play them all. And I've certainly enjoyed doing all Beethoven concerts. I've done several programs with four Beethoven sonatas and that's very richly rewarding as well. Mm. And there's so many different ways you can plan them as well. You can actually schedule them. You can do them in order, chronological order. It works quite well. Andras Schiff does that. You can also do it in a way that Brendel does, and he plays the last big five at the end of each programme with the Appassionato and the Wolstein at the end of the others. Schnabel apparently started with the Pastoral, Opus 28, which is a very strange and unusual but lovely, so welcoming, ushering in way to start. So there's so many ways of doing these things. Yes, I'd love to do a cycle, but it's not actually the be-all and end-all. Mm. Mm. I think actually I'd find it too much with all the other things I do to actually have so 32 sonatas on the go at once right, right. so just just learning them anyway despite not performing them is you feel content with doing yeah. yeah i mean I, I've, I have performed 27 of them so um no 28 now i've only got four to go mm -hmm. so um they will definitely happen what do you think about learning um say beethoven symphony transcriptions have you done that before no i i don't like it okay. um Why i think that? i think it's because I just so love the sound of the orchestra. It's so rich. It's so, so deep. And um, again, going back to Brendel again, he says the piano should imitate the orchestra. And I think, well, if I have a choice of the piano and orchestra, I'd much rather have an orchestra, <laughs> um, which right. is not a very good thing for pianists to say, is it? <laughs> um, if I was living in the 19th century with no recordings, no CDs, no Spotify or whatever, then yes, I would sit down and do them. And Liszt made tremendous transcriptions for them. But there's so much repertoire for us on our own. Um, I'd rather do that, I think. Mm. I've also, a lot of my friends have, um, they're very keen on playing duets, Beethoven symphonies as duets and Brahms. And here I'm going to let you into a terrible secret. I'm not a great fan of duets. I always feel rather squashed. Right. And um, if I'm sitting at the bottom, I'm sort of, get cramp in my leg trying to do the pedal. And if I'm sitting at the top, I feel like a beach whale, but I can't do any pedal. <laughs> um, Actually, last week I played duets with one of my students on two pianos, mm -hmm. and that was also, you know, for the COVID reasons as well. But it felt so much, so much nicer. Right. I think it was probably too much pedal whilst we were both pedalling differently. I love playing two pianos. I mean, that, that is great. Just not two pianists on one piano. No, no. Right. And even again, playing these symphonies, it's it's just not the same. It's mm -hmm. yes, it's a lovely way of getting to know them, getting your fingers about them. But I'm afraid I'd far rather put 
you know, the Berlin Phil on and a good good recording of it and listen to it very loudly. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the, it's it's not musically satisfying, but would you say there's a modicum of educational value for a pianist to learn the transcription? Oh, very much so. Just a modicum. Very much so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's just a personal thing. That it doesn't yes. enrich me as much as it does other people. I see. Yeah. As I've, also, I've also had a great love of all, of all sorts of music. And for example... I'm very old fashioned. I've got a CD player in my car. And if I take you to my car now, well, maybe I will after we finish this interview, you'd be rather surprised at the rather weird selection of things in it. I've got um, Richard Strauss orchestral music, um, some Bruckner symphonies. I bought um, Monte Verdi Vespers in an Oxfam shop in Sirencester two days ago. So I've got to listen to that. There's not much piano music there um, because I sort of feel I know the piano repertoire quite well. There's nothing worse than doing a whole day's practice or a whole day's teaching than going in the car and putting more piano music on. Um, that I can't do. Mm. Um, so I would rather listen to something different, completely different. If you weren't a pianist, what other instrumentalist would you be? Um, I would be a botanist. I probably wouldn't be another instrumentalist. Oh, because okay. I tried to play the violin mm. and I had to be withdrawn from grade two, unfortunately, because I wasn't very good at all or I was extremely bad I think my teacher wasn't great as well but I'm not blaming her I'd blame myself for that I tried the clarinet and I couldn't get on with that I did a bit of percussion a second study at the academy that, that was okay but I'm afraid I really am a one-trick pony and I'd love to be able to conduct as well but I can't do that either in fact um, our trio have done the Beethoven triple concerto several times and the um the piano part's the least demanding part, and the cello part is the most demanding part. But because I simply can't conduct, our lovely cellist, who's a very, very good cellist and a fantastic conductor, he had to do both jobs. Mm. So I felt really rather bad about <laughs> that, but I think sure it was a better result musically. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned botany, actually. Did botany come first or music come first? Or was it um, first? Music came first, um, because I started, I can perhaps just explain how I began, but I lived in Lincolnshire as a child, and I think in 1971 and 1972, there were the um, strikes, the power strikes, the power cuts and the, throughout the winter. And I had an electric keyboard at that point, And I used to apparently cry bitterly when the power went off and I couldn't play anymore. So I was acquired an upright piano and that's, that's how it started from there. And then botany came along. Um, we had a little house in Sutton-on-Sea, which is a small um, little village in Lincolnshire. And as today, the weather was grey and gloomy and miserable, and you couldn't really sit on the beach, so we went botanising, my father and I. And this became a really big passion of mine. Well, also my father's. And then my brother took it up and actually became a professional botanist, and he's now county recorder for Lincolnshire, which is quite a big thing in botanical terms. In fact, he's discovered a rare species of grass. In fact, it's so rare it's new to science, and it's been named after him. So I'm very, very proud that our surname will carry on in botany that's brilliant mm. I, was, I was wondering if you could just slight tangent here but if it's okay to articulate why it is botany captures you um i think it's really beautiful places and um beautiful plants and rare plants seem to like special places and i was quite naughty when i was a student at the academy i remember before my final recital I took a couple of weeks off and went to Scotland <laughs> botanizing which is really outrageous but I don't know it inspired me I just couldn't not do it I absolutely loved it um there were myself and my brother and two other friends we used to go off together we were quite an odd group of people but we used to go off in a car and drive all the way couldn't fly in those days so we did this enormous drive up to Scotland and we had really a hit list of things to see um we went all over the place uh, right up mountains all the way across remote cliffs and um, beaches and things and we've seen I would say most of the really rare plants in Scotland and um, I still do this to this day I was um, I had a couple of free days this week between teaching and doing an adjudication yesterday went to stay with some dear friends in Gloucestershire and went for a walk in the rain and, um, and found it's really nice because I stumbled across greater butterfly orchid which is not very common um, and normally I'm searching for it but here I wasn't searching for it and I found it completely by chance and that was a really beautiful thing mm. it's really precious when you stumble across something like that rather than searching for it and expecting to see it 
Is so it? I've always got my eyes open and people say I'm a rather dangerous driver in the summer but I've got sort of half an eye on the road and one eye on the road verge. <laughs> is it the journey that you like? I love the journey but I love being in the, the special places as well. And of course, you know, this this country is so overpopulated and so encroached by buildings and things. It's amazing what nature does. And there's an absolutely extraordinary event this week which has happened and it hit the um the news there's a very rare orchid which was first it's very common in europe and then it was found in cornwall in 1989 it's called the small tongue orchid and then it disappeared about 10 years ago and this week on top of a tower block in london of a japanese bank a colony of 15 of them have been discovered yes i read that which is absolutely incredible and I don't know how I'm going to get to see it. I'll have to be to winch down by helicopter <laughs> or something, but it's probably not open to the public. Or parachute down. Mm. But that's just an amazing example of nature taking over and just saying, look, you know, I can, I can do what I want here and I can be here. And outside here, I've got a tiny garden, as you know. It's really, really small. But growing on the drain pipe in early April, I found a plant called rue-leaved saxifrage, which is quite, quite uncommon. I mean, it's, it's not, you don't see it often at all. And there it was on my drain pipe. Mm. So I was very happy. You just never know what you're going to see anywhere. And when I studied in Moscow, I found a plant called motherwort, which was um, growing on the walls of the Kremlin. And I told it to a friend of mine who wrote, was writing a book on botany. And it's, it's in the book. Mm. So I'm quite pleased to have a reference there. Has botany ever influenced your music? The way you play? Yes, um, I have a very, very good friend, Peter Lawson. Um, and he wrote... He decided because at that point in time there were 48 wild orchids in Britain, why not write his own 48? So he did. He wrote several. Well, he's written them all now, but he wrote several for me. One was called The Song of the Dark Red Helleborine, and he dedicated it to me, and I gave it its premiere at the Wigmore Hall in my Wigmore debut. And he's written one for the trio as well. And then I had a very bad birthday five years ago, and so he wrote one for that. And um, we had a very nice party here. Um, and it was really nice because my dear teacher Hamish Milne came and um, we played a duet together. And one of my favourite students, Clarence Lam, who's a pianist from Hong Kong, he came and he played as well. So we had a sort of triumvirate of generations mm. playing there. And we, I played Peter's piece in that performance as well. Mm. I just want to go into um, teacher and student relationships. Um, I'm not sure you remember, but I think it was the first three months of our um, sort of work together at mm-hmm. Welsh. Um, I was playing some some piece in lesson, mm-hmm. and midway through, you stopped me. You tapped me on the shoulder and stopped me, and I still remember this. You said, um, "My job here is to make myself redundant." Mm-hmm. I'm not sure you remember you saying that. <clears throat> I do say it quite often, yes. um, but I think it's a really important thing. Yes, and I can't remember that exact situation, but I, I fear I might have told you that. Yes, yes, I, I still, I still remember that actually. Mm-hmm. Eight years, eight years on, and I actually left that lesson being a very naive, and relatively immature eighteen-year-old. I thought to myself, "Well, isn't his job meant to be teaching me, not making himself a <laughs> Isn't he? Isn't that's what? It, that isn't that his his job?" Then it took me a, a while to realise that's not what he meant. He meant something a bit deeper than that, mm. a bit more um, long term. And I was wondering for the listeners if you could explain that bit of wisdom mm. to to people who don't quite understand what he meant by that, because it's it's something that I've applied to many things in my life as well. Yeah, I mean there are other teachers who they look after themselves and think they're the most important things and want to make themselves employable, you know, so they carry on in the work. But I think the job of a teacher is to be a mentor and to think of the student first. And that's why I think, firstly, you have to teach, in inverted commas, every student differently because they're all different people and different personalities and have different needs and requirements. But the best thing we can do is to show, open a door and show them inside and just say, have a look how beautiful it is through this door and see what you can find. And if I can give a student the tools to be able to find those things, to look for themselves... Um, and really, of course, you show them things in a certain piece or a certain example, and they can apply those examples to other pieces and other aspects of, you know, different composers and all sorts of things. Then they can begin to find their own way if they have a very open mind, open-minded approach. 
it's it's obviously different with some people. It takes a long time. You have to tell tell people things again and again before it goes in. Other people, it can be quite quick, and they can be through the door, you know, before you've realised that you've shown them it. Mm. But if they can go on a voyage of discovery and enrichment and um, use the things which hopefully you've helped them with um, to do that, then that's there's nothing that makes me happier than that. Mm. I really am incredibly grateful to all my teachers, but especially Hamish Milne. He was a very, very dear teacher and became a very close friend. And very sadly, he died last year. And you know, he was so inspiring because um, he just said very, very small things, but very pointed things. And that really made me think quite deeply about all sorts of aspects of music. And I'm still feeding off those today. And um, I, I can feel myself doing my best to pass those things on to my students. Mm. You know, if I can teach a hundredth as well as he taught, I'd be very, very, very happy. There's two branches I just want to explore. Um, the late, your teacher and friend, the late Hamish Milne. Was there anything musically that inspired you and you applied to your own professional music life? Um, in Hamish's playing? Or? Yes. Hamish yeah, I mean, the first time I came across him was I was 12 years old and um, his brother, Andrew Mill, was actually second master at Andal School where I was a student. And Hamish had just come up to play Ratmanov 2 with, the, um, I think, the Cambridge Orchestra. And he'd, he'd, he was booked at the very last minute I think it was the concert was either changed, the date was changed, or someone didn't play. And so he came last minute, he played from the music, which is a bit unusual. Um, but he asked me to page turn for him, or I think he asked, was there a student who could read music who could page turn? I was put forward. And um, I was just incredibly, apart from being slightly scared of page turning at the age of 13 or whatever, I was just amazed by the total effortlessness at which he played. And he just made it look as if he was washing up or ironing. But all this <laughs> wonderful sound was, was coming out effortlessly from these long fingers. And I think I, I, was, I had an autograph book then, so I turned up with my autograph book and asked him to sign it, and he did. And then I, turned, I ended up studying at the academy um, where I knew he was a teacher. And I'd learned with a wonderful teacher before that through my teens, Jean Anderson, who was a wonderful, wonderful lady. And then it was time to move on to someone in the senior school and of course he was my my first choice mm. and so um I asked to go and learn with him and and I, I was lucky enough to to have him mm. and I remember lots of things I we had to do lunchtime concerts and I did my first lunchtime concert it was a Bartok piece improvisations opus 20 and I remember sort of bony finger on my shoulder saying I'm expecting great things from you today which made me feel absolutely awful, of course. And I, I can't remember a note of the concert. <laughs> but he was very, very demanding, but in a very sort of gentle, sort of uncle-like way. And um, one thing I always remember was if he'd say, oh, you must listen to a recording of this. And always the next week in his bag, he'd turn up and he'd, have, he'd hand me the CD or cassette, as it was then, probably. He'd never forget. He'd always, always lend it to me. And I've never forgotten that. And I, I try and do the same with my own students. Yes, I, I recall, yeah. Yeah, oh, I think you've still got something in mind. <laughs> no, you haven't, actually. Awesome. I'm, only, I'm only kidding. <laughs> no, no, I'm only kidding. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I still try and do that. And um, or nowadays I send people links to recordings of things. But, you know, he's so inspiring. He always took me to concerts. I think most evenings after my lesson, I was the last thing on the Tuesday, we ended up in the bar together and having a chat. And, you know, he was almost treating me like a young colleague, which was remarkable. Mm. I was about to ask the second branch was what impressed you and applied to your own life socially but the bar, the bar and the taking the students to drinks probably answers the question well I think the thing was um, when he died last year I was left to organise all his music and all his programmes and things and I've been sharing that with friends and colleagues and distributing and there's going to be an archive in the States of his music and I, have, I found two boxes of his concert programmes um, covering 50 years and um, a friend of mine has very kindly sort of gone through them and archived them all. And just looking at the sheer quantity of stuff he got through, the number of concerts he did, solo concerts, chamber concerts, concertos, different repertoire. And he was doing all this at the height of teaching us in the mid-1980s. And yet he still, he always appeared to be completely relaxed, completely laid back, have time to have a drink in the bar with one of his students. I'd have been going off my head. I don't know how he did it. So he just seemed to be like a swan, really. He was just gliding along and probably paddling away a bit underneath where we couldn't see. 
And the other thing was he never told us what he was doing. I suddenly, I even looked in my diary and thought I was studying with him then. He was sort of going off to do a concerto in Birmingham the day after a lesson with me. And you know, he didn't, he'd done a whole day's teaching and just gone and did it and got on with it. Mm. And that was, that was amazing. He never, ever blew his own trumpet. Um, for him, the music always came first. And that was a very inspiring thing. And I, I have little time for people who are more interested in themselves than the, the music. And I would like to feel I try and follow in the same footsteps and feel the same way as that. Mm. Yeah, it's these um, hyper-productive people that seem to inspire me too. Because mm. you know, they've got 24 hours a day and you've also got 24 hours a day. I always wonder where, how, how do they do this? Is it uh, sort of a mental game, do you mm. think, to be this, this productive? I don't know, but he always appeared, um, although he was very efficient in his lessons and timing and teaching, and he was always very well prepared for his concerts, incredibly well prepared. He seemed to be slightly, well, not even chaotic, but slightly sort of laid back. He'd go right. back and practice, and there was a whole pile of books, and you never quite knew what he was going to going to do. But somehow it all got sort of ready and organised. And um, there was another professor at the academy called David Owen Norris, who's a very, very well-regarded pianist yes. and he always said um after some years of experience he gradually got a sort of feeling of if he had to learn a new piece say in september for example depending on the, the piece or the size of the piece in april he'd begin to be sort of get a bit, a bit twitchy yeah. by sort of mid-may it would be sort of full-on panic and you know he just knew when he had to start a piece mm. and when it had to be ready by and something instinctive took over and that mm. um that that got him through it so i feel the same I, i'm quite good at knowing when to start something and if I've got to play it in a certain amount of time. And that's something obviously students gain in experience. I'm probably quite an organised, much to the irritation of many of my friends and colleagues, quite a sort of timetable person. You know, I like to have my breakfast at the same time and practising for a certain amount of time. This is a day I'm at home, of course. And um, so that's just the way I, I go. Some people survive on deadlines. They like doing things at the last minute. I can't deal with that very well I'm not very good at that so I'm a sort of probably a slow burner hmm. and I think that's something you know I wasn't a absolute child prodigy or anything like that I was you know reasonably okay at the academy but I think I've become to understand music and learn it much more deeply now even now you know, maybe perhaps I can't play quite as well as I could when I was younger I think I understand it better and I feel more enriched by it and that's a very interesting thing because I love teaching more and more and more and more, you know, as much as playing, if not more, mm. which has surprised me as well, actually, because I must admit when I was in my 20s, I, I taught to earn money and just to um, you know, keep the wolf from the door and that sort of thing. So that's a real extraordinary change, which has surprised myself, certainly. I'm glad you mentioned the um, Royal Academy in your younger days. Uh, if you can, in the spirit of artistic reflection, how would you describe yourself as a pianist when you were studying at Royal Academy? And how did that change when you went to Moscow? What mm. changed? That's a, I think, uh, to be honest, I don't mean sounding modest, but I think I was quite, I was probably one of the better ones. I was a big fish in a, in a quite a big pond and I was quite flamboyant. I was quite virtuosic. I played lots of concerts, played lots of concertos and played virtuoso repertoire. I think I was probably a bit blinkered as well. I didn't, I spent too much time practicing. I didn't mix enough with my friends and colleagues. I regret that now. Um, when I came to Moscow, I was but a tiny tadpole in an ocean. And I think that really sorted me out. And um, the teaching was very different. The Hamish Milne was very uncle, like an uncle. Um, my teachers in Russia, Tatiana Nikolaeva and Lisa Vesolati, were not like that. It was, um, you were taught to some extent, well, through fear might be not too strong a way to put it. And you just had to do what you were told and there was no discussion and no argument. And, you know, privately I realised I could do what I wanted later in my life. Um, and there were people who were, I was very lucky actually, because in Eliseo's class was Boris Berezovsky, who's an absolutely phenomenal, wonderful, staggering pianist. And he won the Tchaikovsky competition in the year I did it, I was in the semi-finals and he won. So it was amazing to be 
with him during that journey because I used to have my lessons with him. Can you imagine? I had my lessons after him sometimes. <laughs> what that must have felt like. And But somehow when you're young and it's not your own language and you're being taught in Russian, you develop a sort of rhinoceros skin. And um, perhaps all the rude things she was saying to me didn't hurt quite so much as they might have done if they'd been in English. And there was another wonderful guy, Rustem Seit Kulov, um, who lives in Paris, and he's very, 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 very good. And there I was, and Alexander Madja, also from, he was from Serbia. Fantastic, and it was amazing to be with them. I think I'd be horrified now, but somehow when you're younger, it's it's, it's not quite so so bad in a way. Yes. Uh, were you all in one room together having lessons while the other students were watching, or was it private, completely private, one-to-one lessons? Um, with Tatiana Nikolaeva, it was. She she had a big class, and there could be up to 15 people sometimes, and we all sat there and listened to each other. But her lessons were quite short, um, and I must admit her timetable was slightly scatty. Um, but with Eliso, she taught at home, so there'd never been more than one person waiting. She was so much in demand to be listened to as a teacher that sometimes my friends would ask to come with me to her house, which is really embarrassing because... Sometimes I'd turn up with someone in tow and say, well, do you mind if they listen? And she was always a bit cross, but she'd sort of put up with it. Plus her flat was quite small, it was all a bit cramped. But there was such a sort of myth, myth about her and people really wanted to get to know her and know what she was like, and mm. so that, that happened. Yeah. And you were doing the Tchaikovsky whilst you were there. Mm. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us, give us some insight on the preparation and approach to practice for a competition as opposed to a solo recital yeah i mean in some ways a really stupid thing to do because i hadn't done a competition before not a big one and then suddenly here i am going in for one of the biggest ones <laughs> the in the one world one, yeah. so i mean hindsight is absolutely ridiculous thing to do <laughs> but I, I had two years to prepare for it um i knew what the repertoire was going to be i worked really really hard i was taught very very thoroughly Again, I was told what to do. There was absolutely no option oh, <laughs> in anything. I was told what repertoire to play and told which etudes to do. And so I worked and worked and worked and worked. And it, you know, it, I, I played really well. Um, but interestingly, I've still got the recording and listened to it. It doesn't sound like me. It sounds a bit like a turbocharged copy of my teacher. And that's, that's not a good thing. And um, I think perhaps, um, dare I say that, my teacher had a certain aspect of teaching and that all her pupils sounded quite like her. <clears throat> and that would horrify me. I wouldn't like my students to sound like me at all. I want them to sound like them. Mm. So admittedly, you know, I played marvellously. In some ways, maybe I played better than I should have done. And that's not a good thing. Um, it would have been better to have had a slow burn and done things more slowly. But I was adamant on doing the Tchaikovsky competition and if you do that you've got to do well so I had to be taught in a certain way so that's why we we did it mm. um, but it wasn't it certainly wasn't making me think for myself it was telling me what to do and how to do it and um, so I wouldn't necessarily advocate that for other people it must have been quite stressful right well actually I'm just remembering after that I decided I came back home thinking well I've got in the semi-final of Tchaikovsky comp I must be brilliant so then I entered the um, Queen Elizabeth competition in Brussels which is one of the other big ones I went sailing out of the first round <laughs> I did something even more stupid in that I played a new etude which I'd never played before which one was that? it was um, Paul et saint Droit for the Five Fingers by Debussy and then another one Chopin Opus 10 number 10 I mean that was so stupid um, I hadn't had any guidance I hadn't thought I hadn't asked anybody um, so I think one needs to think more carefully about those sorts of things and later latterly I got some more sense and did some old repertoire and then I I won a competition doing something that I could actually knew I actually knew and I could play mm. so um but I had to learn slightly the hard way I had a slightly weird sort of trajectory with competitions right who was on the panel for Tchaikovsky do you remember um about 20 people it was quite terrifying That's quite um good. well James Gibb he was the English chap and he became a I had some lessons with him and he became a very good sort of acquaintance stroke friend. He was formerly head of the keyboard at the Guildhall and he was a really very good teacher. Um, Viktor Majanov, um, who 30 years later, well, 20 years later, I found myself sitting on a jury with. And that was amazing because um, I went to Russia many times after having studied there. I went to Tambov and um, there was a young pianist competition there. He was on the jury. And... 
unfortunately he'd been on joy in brussels as well and kicked me out but he didn't remember that um but we had a very good relationship and it was one of those scary things when i was on the joy in tambov there was a jury concert so i had to play um so i played les Adia, but i think you played that didn't you no oh that was uh, the other student ah okay you played i was 22 didn't you that's correct yeah, yeah. anyway um so i played that and um my genre, i was pretty scared because all the competitors were there and they, they all played better than me <laughs> even though they're teenagers and um Mishanov was there as well now she was very very nice to me afterwards so I was relieved and pleased do you, and, remember, um, do you remember what he said to you he said you play very lyrically and yeah, that was that was good enough for me yeah. I was very very happy with that I'll take that hmm. yeah do you think there's a danger of knowing who the panelists are because you tend to say predict and then um, adapt your playing to what they would like do you reckon there's a tendency for competitors to do that I, I think some can do. There's a, <clears throat> there's of course been terrible history of corruption in music compositions. This is getting a lot better now, but actually the year I did the Tchaikovsky, there were very big problems, and um, Jimmy Gibb, he was the chap who managed to find out these things and he made them public, and it was quite a big scandal. Um, so depending on your personality, I can imagine if you were a certain type, you might see who was on the joy and who liked what, and whether you play your Bach with pedal or not, or whatever. Um, I had no option because I was being taught sort of by dictatorship and being told what to do. Um, personally, I I would advise any student I'd get them to play as well as they could and to play the way they feel it should go. And, and you know, sincerity and commitment are the most important things. There's nothing more important than that. And to be honest, if you're, as I've learned now, if you're on a panel and you can hear people playing and they don't believe in what they're doing, it's noticeable. It's okay. obvious. So um, I would never, never advocate that. But I think nowadays competitions, things have got much better than they, they were before. Hmm. Just following on from that artistic reflection from REM to Moscow, how do you see yourself as a pianist now after having done all that? How would you describe your, your pianism today? I feel very, very rich, very experienced. Um, how can I describe it? I, yes, I think... Like I was talking about Beethoven, um, my love of music sort of gets deeper and deeper and greater. Funnily enough, I, I don't like practicing as much as I used to. When I was a student, when I was young, I, was, I perhaps practiced a bit too much, really. I did six to eight hours a day. Now I, I just I don't like doing that. Um, I don't like being on my own quite so much. I like sharing with people, so I like playing chamber music, and I like teaching, and I like coaching and doing all these things. So I practice less, but hopefully more wisely, not necessarily more successfully, but I think things do get more difficult as you get older. I think a memory is harder. I, I certainly find that. And um, But then if you think of lots of the very great pianists of Brendel, Pellini and people like this, they've learned most of their repertoire by their mid to late forces. They, they're not often learning new pieces or quite a lot of people aren't. So that gives me comfort sometimes when I'm struggling to learn a new piece and I'm remembering you when I was 15, it would have gone in like melted butter and now I'm having to hammer it in um, yeah. and it's just not having it, you know. Mm. So I try not to force things. Um, I'm perhaps slightly um, less ambitious in what I'm going to learn in mm. terms of quantity of repertoire. Mm. Um, it's very nice sometimes to say no. No, I don't want to play that piece. And of course, you know, for, for students and things, they can't, they can't do that. They have to take every opportunity. But I've sometimes learned that saying no is a, a nice thing also your interest in certain repertoire changes um as i said i used to play lots of transcriptions and virtuoso stuff um i find that a bit shallow and unsatisfying now um i'm not saying it's wrong or anything like that for me it is maybe that's a better way of putting it whereas i get more out of the really great composers and, and sort of gravitate towards them more mm. Can can musicality be taught or is it something you're born with? I think it can be enriched. <clears throat> I think probably it is born with to some extent. Um, yeah, I think it, it can be um, it can be nurtured from a very small base to something quite considerable. But I think um, extreme, you know, phenomenal, amazing musicality is probably inherent at, at birth or pretty young. Mm. I would say so. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm wondering if you had a similar experience because I, I was listening to Yefim Bronfen mm. play um, Rachmaninoff Piano Concerto Number Three. Right. And it was the second movement. And do you know when the piano comes in? Mm. The long, tumultuously. Tumultuously. Mm. And he played first two notes of the melody mm-hmm. after the chromatic. Mm-hmm. And just from two notes, it made me cry. Mm-hmm. And just the way he played those two notes. Mm. And I, I just thought that is inherent musicality there. Mm. Just from two notes, you can make me feel so much. Mm. I was wondering if you mm. had anything similar to that experience where a pianist hasn't really played much, but has already made you feel so much. Mm. Um, there are two things there. There's the lockdown effect, and that's made me very emotional about music. And right. I found myself either moved to tears or um, feeling tearful or either even thinking about music or listening to it or, or playing it. or. Mm. Um, but yes, um, certainly um, I've been, my emotions have been at the, the forefront and um, certain things are very, very touching again and again. It can surprise you, it can catch you out sometimes. And I think the really special things are when my students make me cry, which is not every lesson. Um, I'd say it probably happens once a year or something like that, but occasionally I move to tears and that's really very, very special. I remember when I was playing, um, this is actually going back to the Tchaikovsky competition, I was mm-hmm. preparing for that and I was playing Mozart Concerto K482 and my teacher was playing the orchestral part and she just suddenly stopped and said, oh, I can't. It's so beautiful. <laughs> and um, of course the student, oh, what's all this about? <clears throat> but then I was playing K488, the A major one, with somebody last week and I felt the same. Mm. So I told him what had happened to me in Moscow and he said, oh, I'll never forget that, so I should remember that. And that, that was a very special moment. Mm. There are just a few pieces where, not because of your own performance, of course, but because of the music, you can feel tearful. One of those is at the end of the Tchaikovsky Piano Trio, because that's such a massive journey of 50 minutes of extraordinary sort of depths of tragedy and joy and everything. And I always feel very moved at the end of that, and I've felt a bit sniffly sometimes. I hesitate to add again, not because of my performance. Um, the other places in the Archduke, piano trio where there's an absolutely beautiful cello movement and the cello moment in the slow movement and that's always that always gets me i think you know whatever and the other solo piano piece for me is the end of the first book of Anne de pelerinage by Liszt, when you get to the bells of geneva that's a very transcendental moment and it's it just it really does um get me yeah. in a particular way what would your advice be to someone who wants to be more musical in their play um love it more don't try too hard just to sort of envelop yourself in it and embrace it and be at one with it um don't approach it too technically be be emotionally connected with it mm. i think that's um that's good if you if you start thinking about it it's a bit like saying don't think of an elephant so of course you, you think about one um try and make it as part of yourself to whatever extent you can yeah yeah I think so this is a question I've found quite interesting to ask people. Let's say hypothetically, mm-hmm. in a world where the piano's hammers are muted, mm-hmm. so when you press the keys, nothing comes out, mm-hmm. but the touch and the weight of the piano doesn't change. Mm-hmm. Just not, no sound comes out. Mm-hmm. So this is in regards to sound, a pianist's sound. If you were to play that muted piano, and all you had to receive, all the information that you received was the muscles mm-hmm. and the way your body reacted to the mm-hmm. piano. Would you be able to tell if you made a good sound or not? Just yeah. from your body? Yeah, I think you so. You would tell? Yeah. Because I think um, if when things are working really well, if the, the, arm and the, the arm and the shoulder and the wrist and the back and the elbows, really everything are working as one, then you get this really wonderfully free, deep movement. And I often say, to my students, if you want to make a really good sound, imagine you're very tired, which they usually are, or like a like a very sort of tired bear, sort of moving very sort of deeply and going right down to the ground and feeling that sort of weight. And sometimes, actually, this is a terrible admission of what it feels like to be in your mid fifties. You know, some days you feel physically great, other days you, you know not so great. And I can't help but notice, you know, some days I've got a better sound than, than others. It's a bit more variable than it used to be. Mm. 
and you know when it's good it's a sign that things are working really well and other things it's some more noticeable i think self-awareness is also very considerably important because i think i am quite aware much more aware than i used to be um but then of course inevitably physically your prowess sort of changes doesn't it mm. i found alexander technique really helpful i've had two bouts of it in my life and um i remember an amazing moment um my first teacher was a cellist and this is going back 25 years now and you know we did all the table stuff and it was standing up and but then she said, now I want to work with you at the piano. So I went to her piano and I played The Great Gate of Kiev. And um, she, she did something to my shoulder and suddenly my sound sort of doubled. I don't know how she did that. It was amazing. And I must admit now I'm not a very big person, but I can make quite a big sound. And I'm sure a lot of that is to do with Alexander Technique. I found it incredibly helpful. Because hmm. I know some pianists think before they play a sound. Do you do that too? Do you visualize the notes or the the sort of the tonal colors you want to create, and then you do it, mm. or do you? Is oh yeah, it quite immediate. Yeah, I think you have to think about what you want to do. But if you don't, then you just get anything, and you have to go with it. In fact, I always say that you know, think what sound you want to make, because then you can make a choice. Otherwise, if you just make any sound, then you've you've got no choice. It's like selecting a, a paint or or a color. Um, Brendel, sorry, Brendel again. We he says um we have to listen in three ways we have to listen to what we're doing in the light of what we've done and thinking about what we're going to do in the future so that's that's really significant i think mm. also one more thing he said which is really really important and um I, I tell this to my colleagues and students a lot listen is an anagram of silent mm. that's a really good good thing isn't it because music does come from silence doesn't yes. it I'm so glad you mentioned Brendel because um, I read an essay by him called On Recitals and Programs. I'm mm. not sure if you've read it. Um, I think I have. Um, you have to remind me of it. Yes, of, <laughs> of course. Yeah. So uh, among other things, um, how to program effectively, mm -hmm. there was a passage in the essay where he said, we shouldn't treat old music, so old music like Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, uh, Chopin, like titans in a museum, quote unquote, titans mm -hmm. in the museum, to be preserved and looked at. And that's all we do with them. Mm -hmm. But instead, he should, as he advised in the essay, give them life again and relate them to our own times. Mm. Now, this got me thinking with another thing that Leonard Bernstein said mm -hmm. in his Young People's Concerts, in the first one, mm -hmm. where he was trying to redefine classical music classical music as a term mm. saying that it should be called exact music instead yeah now there's arguments against this but i won't go in that for now mm. it says that classical music is a bunch of instructions in a very narrow framework of interpretation now if we combine these two ideas together bringing it to life and relating it to our modern times mm. and also the term exact music where the framework is so narrow mm. How do we do this? How do we operate within these two boundaries? I just want to know what you think about this. It's very interesting, isn't it? Because when we listen to people play today, there's very different performing tradition from 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago. And lots of this is, of course, to do with recording because people are so used to hearing recordings being perfect. Um, and you know, people try and play perf perfectly. And they often concerts often sound like recordings these days. Whereas some... Um, you know, have you noticed people's voices sound a bit more similar to each other than they did 50 years ago if you listen to announcements and things on programs and recordings? And I think then um, you could tell people's individual voices much more 50 years ago. And then going back further, of course, pre-recordings and when you had to do things in one take, people weren't so worried about accuracy. So they would put more of their musical feelings into what they were doing and just sort of go for it, really. And so... Um, some of that rubato and the time taking and the voicing and the shaping is completely outrageous and um there was a <clears throat> i got recently acquired some cds of frederick lamond who was the first person to record the complete beethoven sonatas i believe before schnabel even and um they're, they're sort of amazing but they're very hard to listen to in certain ways because he very rarely plays the hands together um which sounds lovely sometimes but actually it does become a bit 
irritating. But then why should I say that? Because that's what was normal then. Um, there were just such big traditions and the freedom which he takes. Well, you can say, well, Beethoven wouldn't have wanted that. He'd have written exactly what he wanted. But then he felt about it differently. So why should his way be better than ours? I, and um, I also remember another thing. When I was at um, the academy as a student, we had a general history lesson and um, we were given 10 different recordings of Chopin's B minor sonata. And one friend of mine, who's a really fantastic brain and marvellous pianist, he, he knew who all 10 people were because of the individuality, because of the sound, because of the tempo, because of the voicing, because of this and that. I think I only got half of them, so I was really cross. Still impressive. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I reckon now if we... Um, heard 10 people playing it who'd recorded it in 2019, 2020, they might not sound quite so disparate. Um, so I think the bandwidth has narrowed in that particular sense. Quite often I listen to people. It's quite a good test, actually, isn't it? When you, if you put on Radio 3 in your car and you hear some piano music and you drive home and you think, well, I, I had an example the other day. I thought, oh, this is really lovely. And I sat and listened in my car outside the house you know I had to finish it before I could I wanted to know who it was before I could go back in and it was someone I've claimed I've never liked <laughs> so <laughs> there we are I had egg completely all over my face so I, I take that back <laughs> by the way I think um I would always give any musician or pianist three chances you know there's, there's a certain pianist um who I've always been very very interested in and I've been, I went to hear them once, I didn't like it. Once again, still didn't like it. So I thought, I'll give them a third chance. I didn't like that either. And I was really upset I didn't like it, but I'm still interested in them. Um, I wouldn't, some people give people one chance and then they, they're dismissed immediately. But we all have off nights, don't we? We all have um, variable quality nights. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So, yes, I think individuality has probably disappeared to some extent. Having said that, there are very, very wonderful and very, very fantastically great pianists around these days. What would you say was the cause of that identity feel, that shrinkage of identity? Mm. I think probably, as I mentioned, CD recordings and, and things because everything has to be absolutely in the place and every note has to be absolutely there. But still, the critics are going to be sort of hanging on to every mistake or looking for every bad edit or something. I think that's a that's the thing also maybe the speed of our lives and well until recently um everyone was traveling everywhere and things were sort of intermixing and you know 100 years ago there were pianists in russia who played like they did and then pianists in germany who played very differently and um i think maybe there were more individual schools mm. going on in those days do you think globalization was a a culprit in this connect it did the connection of so many different like the internet for example you can you could watch someone from um china play from here mm. which you couldn't do 100 years ago yeah i think it's absolutely wonderful and it's amazing and fantastic but it, it has probably taken a toll in another way that um there is a sort of similarity between things and one thing i was of course really do bemoan as we have so many possibilities these days and you know, all these recordings are fingertips that um certainly piano students seem to know less and they're, they're less curious and they they'll often say oh, i watched something on youtube and you saw who was it and they don't know right um and i my reply to that was if i went out to the shops and bought you a sweater would you mind if i just made my own choice no of course i wouldn't so um it's so important to obviously to know who you're listening to and because there are lots of things on youtube which are you know not great um, so we have to be very, 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 very careful about that. Yes. So yes, I think globalization's had a had an effect on this in both a good way and you know and also a questionable way as well. Mm. Absolutely. Um, final two questions. I wish we could talk for longer, but I think the video has a time limit. Okay. <laughs> um, I know this probably might be a hard question, but do you have a favourite edition of a score? Um, of the ones you have. Well, I, I could show you something really special. Um, oh, okay. Let's turn the camera off. I can show you a couple of really nice things if you want. Uh, can we do that? What do you mean? I can, I can hold them oh, up in front yeah, of the yeah, camera. That'd be, that'd be fantastic, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. So if I open them both up. <clears throat> so this is a very special thing. 
These are the oh, Varagas your long for Jesus. And I was lucky enough when I was at the academy um, to play to him. And so, to Messia? Yes, and to Von Lorio. So there is, um, there's Messian's signature oh. and a very nice sentence from Von Lorio at the bottom. So that, that was what really does nice. The, what does the message say? <clears throat> well, it's very nice. It says um, to James Kirby, who has a lot of talent. Oh. <laughs> so that, that was really nice. And um, the other thing is, I was talking about Hamish Milne. Yes. I was sorting through his stuff and then found this copy of Chopin Sonatas. And it was his copy. And there is um, an interesting autograph inside. Oh, so that's from uh, oh, Arthur Rubenstein. Rubenstein. Amazing. Yeah. Because Hamish was a student in Italy at the time, studying with Agosti, and obviously went to a concert of Rubenstein's and had the, had his Chopin sonata signed. Amazing. <clears throat> so those are two particularly precious things. Yes. The other thing, I suppose, is my Beethoven sonatas edition, which is the, the Henley Urtex, but it's really precious to me because it's got all my markings in from 30 years of study, except, there were, as I say, there were still four sonatas with no markings <laughs> in yet, but um, they will they will come. Yeah. Yeah, I still have my scores where, uh, with your markings in them. Oh sure. dear. Yes. I try and get students to mark in their own things now, so I've obviously changed <laughs> since then. Yes. But. Well, yeah, it was it was majority mine, but there are a few mm. few markings yeah. that were yours. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just a, just a final question, just to wrap up the episode. Uh, it's been so fun mm. hearing your stories again, and hearing new opinions I haven't heard before. Actually. Oh right, good. Um, I'm not sure if you heard the cliche. That your university days are the best years of your life. Have you heard of this mm -hmm. thing? Yeah. Um, do you think that's true as a pianist yourself? Um, what do you think? Life after university has been much better than your time at university. I think for me, it probably has actually. I'm not saying. I think it was an amazing period of study, but it was a bit like um, sort of feeding something which then grows and is able to do its own thing itself. So I would say I, I probably enjoyed my life even more after studying um, because as I say it's somehow it's very difficult to explain I have better understanding of music than I have before it's more enriching and I love it more and more as I get older and the more knowledgeable and experienced I become hmm. I think it changes um, I mean I wouldn't have been without my time at the academy I wouldn't be without my time in Moscow but it'd be hard to say they're even better than the time I've, I'm having now or have had before I think it's life as a constantly changing kaleidoscope and i think i enjoyed everything oh james thank you so much yeah pleasure pleasure anthony